Attention shoppers, if you see someone shoplifting, no you didn't. That's right, people are already struggling and there's no need to make it worse. So if you see someone stealing from our store, no you didn't. Christmas lights are 25% off, minding your own business is free. Stop snitching. Why is it a red flag when men describe women as low maintenance, chill, wifey material, or a ride or die? So in order to understand this, you need to know about a concept called semantic satiation or semantic change, which basically means that if certain words are used repetitively enough, they start to lose their meaning over time. And the reason these words have lost their positive connotation is because women have found out through either dating or observing men that there are subliminal messages hidden behind these labels that men don't even realize. For example, a low-maintenance chill wife used to mean a woman that was down for whatever, super laid back, and didn't nag. But underneath that description is really a woman who doesn't voice her concerns even when she needs to, enables their partner to disregard family, household, and relationship duties, and they don't hold their man accountable when he's wrong. Another example is a ride or die, which was a phrase that originated in the black community that used to mean a person, in this case a woman, that sticks by your side through good and bad times. But underneath that description is really a woman who would go as far as to put her mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical health in harm's way in order to benefit their partner. I get why men find it difficult to understand why these words have developed such a negative connotation because the women you would ascribe these labels to enhance your lives. But what you guys don't see is that a lot of the times they are enhancing your lives at the expense of their own, even if they may not realize it. A news story came out today surprising absolutely nobody. The darling of the detransition movement came out as transgender again. The reason why you shouldn't be surprised by this is that detransition statistics are often overinflated, and the majority of people who transition and then detransition will often transition yet again. This is very similar to the ex gay movement of the 90s, and I've just got to play this clip from you from one of the actual movement videos from back in the 90s. Watch this. You've been lied to. You were not born this way and you can heal. Anthony Falzerano is preaching one of the more controversial and politically incorrect gospels of the day. The Homosexuals are made, sin. not born, he um, says. How many of you in this room were sexualized before the age of 18? Through inappropriate early hand. exposure to sexuality, and emotionally that. absent fathers. It's surprising how many of these same arguments from the ex-gay movement have gotten recycled into the political detransition movement. In reality, detransitioners deserve all of our love and support, and the people that are weaponizing them to try to restrict care for transgender people should be ashamed. Burn my house to the ground! My family's dead! What do I do? Okay, I like this conversation. Poor people stop having kids, and then what? Because y'all love to act like this is just a common sense take. So what happens next after the poor people stop having kids? Because let's say hypothetically all the poor people stop having kids. Poverty is still going to exist and children are going to suffer. So the point literally meant nothing. It does nothing to contribute to the conversation. People not having kids isn't affecting poverty. What is it affecting? It's affecting the demographic of people who are poor. Let me explain. Because of how this country came about, what it was built off of, and <laughs> those poor people are disproportionately queer. They're disproportionately people of color and they're disproportionately disabled. You see how the more you actually think about the words that come out of your mouth when you say it, it turns from just this common sense take to the big E, right? And like really think, throughout history, for marginalized people, when has there ever been a good time to have kids according to y'all standards? Y'all are not these big brain thinkers for these surface level takes, you just don't care enough to do research on them. Considering what HBO Max has done to Sesame Street, Here's a Sesame Street clip, part of which is from 1974. This is why it matters that they're removing old episodes. Do you suppose we could count together? Yeah. Okay. I'll go first, and you go second, okay? okay. I'll, I'll do the first one, and then you, then you. I and, go first. Oh, you, you want to go, go first? Second. Okay, you go first. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, eight nine, nine, ten, ten eleven, eleven, twelve, twelve, thirteen, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen, fifteen, fifteen, 
What's after 15? After 15 comes... Uh, 16. Oh, God, that's... 16. 17. 18. 19. 19. Um, what comes after 19? 20. John, John, is that you all grown up? It sure is, Harry. Oh, great to see. I guess they don't call you John John anymore, huh? No, Harry, they don't. Now they call me John Williams. And what's this you got on, John? Well, now I'm in the Air Force. Whoa. And I've been in for about a year and a half. Maybe for old time's sake we could just do a little counting? Sure we from, can. From 16, huh? Okay, but I'll go first. You go second. Right. Okay. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. I hope that wholesome video brightened up your day. Oh, my pronouns? He, him. Uh, just he. Uh, he, him. Oh wow, nobody's ever asked me that before. Oh, just, uh, he, him. Yeah, yeah. Tell me how you racially identify. I identify as Korean. Let's discuss how white supremacy also harms white people. So when we talk about cultural appropriators, the first thing that they will always say in defense of themselves is that they are cultural appreciators who love and appreciate the culture so much that they want to be a part of it. The problem with that is you cannot love a culture without loving the people. The people are the culture, they cannot be separated. So if you are disregarding the boundaries that those people are setting for how they want you to engage with their culture, you do not love or respect them. You are not feeling love, what you are feeling is actually jealousy. You are jealous of the sense of identity and community that other people have with their cultures, cultures because that is something that white people in America and England do not have. And this is what we mean when we say that white supremacy also harms white people. Because the minute that you set your identity marker as dominant and force its assimilation on other people who you have deemed inferior, you have robbed yourself of the opportunity to be distinct because you have set your culture as the default, as the norm, and so it no longer feels special. And so when whiteness realizes what it has lost, the sense of identity, uniqueness, distinctness, it does what jealous people do. It attempts to rob other people of that same sense of uniqueness, identity, and distinctness by enveloping their cultural practices into its own mediocrity so that those practices don't feel distinct anymore either. They feel like they are the norm, like something that everybody has access to. And it is something that is like, so nefarious, so devious, it is extremely painful. I, I feel physical anger when I see videos of black fishing and things like that. Um, but I also feel that it is something that is coming from a real place of loss and pain that white people and whiteness has yet to address, has yet to acknowledge, and that I don't think anybody really knows how to heal. Um, so that is just my two cents. Why do you call us males? Why not just call us men? <clears throat> Bro, you've got to be freaking kidding me. It's not that serious. It's just a word. I call you males because that's what you are. You're males. Speaking of which, are you having a little male issue right now? Did you get hit in the nuts, bro? <laughs> are your testosterone levels out of whack? Oh my God, I swear. Males are so freaking sensitive.
If you saw a dog doing this, what would you think? Well, here is an explanation. This is a task that is taught to service dogs to aid those with PTSD, psychiatric, or heart conditions. In my case, Delta is watching for people coming towards us so she can alert me to prevent me from being startled. By doing this, she is preventing a medical and a psychiatric episode. Why aren't there public fruit trees and nut trees? Racism and classism. Because female trees produce fruit, cities go out of their way to only plant male trees. Male trees produce pollen, which is what makes our allergies so much worse. Also, poor areas have 25% less trees, which makes poor areas physically hotter than rich areas. The prohibition of public fruit trees in the U.S. increased as the fear of socialism in the U.S. increased. Cities started prohibiting fruit trees throughout the 20th century. Part of the reason was the legal idea of attractive nuisance, which in this context means that they thought that public fruit trees would attract children to climb the trees for the fruit, fall, and get hurt. But another big part of it was the general American anxiety of shared resources. Who would care for the trees? Who had the rights to harvest them? How much fruit could one harvester legitimately take? Could one person just come up to a fruit tree and take all the fruit off of it? Would they be able to enforce only white people eating from these public fruit trees? All of these questions led to the prohibition of fruit trees in the 20th century. I found out about the shenanigans on Twitter when Fat Fab Feminist tweeted about it. Um, skinny people using this song specifically about growing up as a fat person um, to talk about their teeth and how they're too skinny and uh. It's such a great analogy for where mainstream body positivity is now compared to what it was intended for. It was created to liberate the most marginalized of bodies, you know, black, brown, disabled, fat, super fat bodies. And now it's been watered down to being about self-love and body image. This song isn't for you. This song isn't for you. Yes, I'm gatekeeping. Yes, I'm gatekeeping this. This is specifically about growing up fat and being fat. I just really wish then people would stop commandeering these things and these movements. Inserting yourself, taking up too much space. Oh yeah, Picasso like really stole from African art. What is the word for when shit don't surprise you no more? But every time it fucking happens, you're still fucking surprised. Clown! My family's dead! What do I do? Come on guys, let's use our brains. What is the problem? Poverty or poor people having children? Now, now, now let's, let's think one more time. Is the solution to this fixing poverty or poor people not having children? Okay, one more thing. If you agree with this, what is the solution? The sentence, poor people shouldn't have children, has a therefore that you are not saying out loud. A lot of you don't even notice that you're not saying it out loud. But that sentence ends with a therefore. Poor people shouldn't have children, so therefore they should be sterilized. Poor people shouldn't have children, so therefore they should be socially reprimanded. Just because you don't say the eugenics part of the sentence doesn't mean it's not there. Capitalism got y'all believing it's easier to sterilize poor people than to end capitalism. I grew up fucking butt poor and I was happy as fuck. I wish my biggest problems were poverty. You could be a good parent whilst dirt poor. Yo, shut the fuck up. Five things that were built by enslaved people, literally. 
One, Wall Street. Wall Street was named after an actual wall, which enslaved people built in 1653. One of the largest slave markets used to be at Wall Street in the 1700s. Two, Trinity Church in New York. The architects rented enslaved people to build the church. Of course, they were never paid for their labor. Their enslavers were paid instead. Three, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Built in 1793, it is the oldest public university in the country and was built by enslaved people. The school continued to use enslaved labor to maintain the buildings on its campus until 1865. Four, Monticello. Thomas Jefferson's home in Charlottesville, Virginia. Enslaved people leveled the hill on which the house sits, made the bricks, quarried the limestone, chopped the lumber, and built the frame of the home. And five, the White House. Over the course of eight years, enslaved people quarried stone and brick and helped build the structure of the White House. They also rebuilt the executive mansion after it burned down in the War of 1812. This is devastating. By now you've all heard about the Colorado mass shooting Club Q, the LGBTQ club. But I've been waiting for news to confirm it. One of the victims was a bartender there named Daniel Aston, who one of my followers forwarded to me. Daniel was a transgender man and posted often on Twitter. One of his tweets about Club Q said, Every time I have thoughts about leaving Club Q, I stop because one of the patrons tells me, You're the reason I love this place. Or... You're the reason why I feel so safe here. The fact that his life was cut early on Transgender Day of Remembrance is a travesty. And we owe it to him to push back against the anti-LGBTQ voices responsible for his death and those around him. Rest in peace, Daniel. It's interesting to me the way that the politics of hypocrisy and like hypocrisy as used in individualized discourse is so much more easily weaponized against women than men. The mechanism by which that works is something that I've been calling moral fetishization, which is basically just the idea that like women are either considered to be morally pure and incorruptible and honest and ethical, or um, they are evil and conniving and manipulative and all the rest. The myth of the model victim is one manifestation of this, but it's not the only manifestation of this, whereby women who have been victims of patriarchal misogynistic violence um, can just be sort of dismissed or thrown out when anybody finds anything bad that they've ever done. And it seems to just sort of come from this general inability of our culture to see women as complex beings, as being able to do good and bad things which need to both be held together in context. Something that our culture routinely proves itself capable of doing when talking about famous or influential men. But with women, it seems like the general impulse to like consider women to be morally pure and incorruptible is actually a required prerequisite to this kind of dehumanization. I think that you can actually see this specific kind of dehumanization manifest um, in depictions of other different oppressed groups under white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. People of color and indigenous people are considered to be pure and uncorrupted and and like morally superior until they do anything wrong ever and all of a sudden they're conniving and evil and bad. You can also see exactly this in representations of children and effeminate men. Only people at the top of the hierarchy ever get the privilege of being seen as complicated full beings. Watching Wendell and Wild, most people don't seem to realize that its main character is heavily implied to be Afro-Indigenous. With that in mind, let's talk Native representation in media. I'm Native of the Lumbee Tribe, and this has been a series on my TikTok, so let's dive into it. Wendell and Wild is a new stop-motion film from Henry Selick and Jordan Peele that follows the character of Cat, a troubled orphan who makes a deal with two demons to bring her deceased parents back to life. And Cat is heavily implied to be Afro-Indigenous. This is hinted at in a few ways. At the start of the film, Cat's mom is seen wearing a coat with a pattern that is very evocative of the kind of patterns and weaving that could be found in specific native cultures. She also wears a beaded necklace and just generally, beading is a very common part of native cultures, especially on Turtle Island. And after her mother's death, Kat continues to wear the necklace, further referencing this native heritage. Now, while indigenous people are generally very underrepresented in media, 
Afro-Indigenous people are virtually non-existent. If you follow me on here, you know part of my entire shtick is talking about Native representation in media, yet this is only the second Afro-Native character that I have encountered. Because of this extreme lack of Afro-Indigenous representation, Kat and her mom in this film are nothing short of revolutionary. And I also really just love how casual this representation is. It doesn't need to be a major storyline, it just so happens that the main character of Wendell and Wilde is a goth Afro-Indigenous icon. This casual diversity is just a fact that is built into this world, and also brilliantly extends to other Native characters as well. But we'll talk about that next. Ooh, creme brulee. There is no more pathetic and insecure group of men than those who refer to themselves as alpha and sigma males and call others betas. And this is all besides the fact that the entire alpha male theory is based on a single scientific study that was later debunked by its author. These men loudly and obsessively proclaim their own strength in order to have other people think they're strong and never see through the facade. These men base their entire self-worth on validation from women, but also mistreat and objectify women in order to make those women leave so they can blame them instead of having to look inward. And until they look inward, they will continue to spread a rhetoric that is fundamentally dangerous to women. Yummy! There are two markers through which TERFs define womanhood. The first one is a functional reproductive system, and the second one is their ability to tolerate pain, whether it be physical, emotional, or mental. The second woman in that video goes on to say that she had four children, I think back to back, and how difficult and painful that process was for her, which is how she measures her womanhood. And it made me realize that a lot of TERFs are a little bitter and kind of jealous about the fact that there are certain painful things that cis women will go through that trans women won't. While this may sound kind of insensitive, your lack of boundaries when it comes to your partner and your body are not trans women's fault. It is not her fault that you decided to go through an experience that is ranked second to burning alive in the pain index four times. And it certainly doesn't make her any less of a woman. Sorry. You have a heart. A cold one. It is November 19th, aka Men's Mental Health Awareness Day, and I would just like to tell y'all that I don't know what you're expecting here. This specific, like, issue bugs me so fucking much, not because I don't think men's mental health is important, because I do, but because men seem to be sitting around and just waiting for a mental health movement to pop up. You can't be upset that there's no mainstream men's mental health movement when every single time one pops up trying to address the root causes of why men's mental health is so bad, y'all start clowning on it. If y'all are not willing to take a stance against toxic masculinity or this idea of roast culture or this idea that you need to be a man, y'all are not going to create a working mental health movement. Instead of complaining about the lack of a movement, create one. They're about to cook a tasty designer bag. Let's check it out. This video is for anyone who thinks that the police are necessary. They do not properly fulfill any of the functions in society that they are supposed to. They're supposed to prevent crime. Turns out the criminal justice system magnifies the conditions that lead to crime. They're supposed to respond to emergencies. They respond all right. They show up unprepared for violent emergencies and unalive people who are having mental health crises because they have not been properly trained to deal with these emergencies. They enforce traffic laws while racially discriminating and putting people in danger, replacing the cops with compartmentalized professionals who respectively handle mental health crisis responses, traffic safety violations, violent emergencies, and community safety would much better serve society. But the police aren't here to protect you, they're here to make you afraid of and comply with the establishment. Abolish the police. That looks beautiful and I would like to eat that. This is for everyone following the ICWA case. If this is your first time hearing about the Indian Child Welfare Act, also known as ICWA, please go to my link tree. We have resources and videos to get you caught up, petitions we need everyone to sign. The Supreme Court has already heard arguments on the case and we are waiting for a ruling now. Uh, this is where I am going for updates on that. 
While you're there, please check out this petition as well. It's in support of adding a Cherokee Nation delegate to Congress. Remember, it is also still Indigenous Heritage Month. Be sure to amplify Indigenous creators while you're on this app. Thank you.